Hello and welcome back to Express videos relating to ACCA paper F7. Don't forget to download our Express notes, you, which you can easily find on our website www.theexpgroup.com. In this video, we'll cover financial instruments. At the level of F7, financial instruments are tested on a fairly basic level. The most complicated thing in the exam will be a convertible bond, which is the examiner's favorite. How to study financial instruments? First of all, we, know, we have to know how to classify them. Either they are financial liabilities or financial assets, they are debt instruments or equity instruments. We have to know the difference between amortized cost accounting and fair value accounting. And we have to know the accounting treatment of convertible bonds in particular. A financial instrument is just a contract. A contract which actually give rise to a financial instrument to one party of the contract and the financial liability to the other party. Examples of financial assets will actually include Something like trade receivable, options, investment in equity shares of another company, but also cash is a financial asset or um, the possibility of actually exchanging financial instrument in conditions which are potentially favorable for the company. That is also a financial asset. Initial recognition it will be the fair value and will exclude transaction costs because those will actually be expensed directly in the PNL. Directly in PNL. Subsequent measurement will depend, uh, it can actually be shown either at fair value, which can be fair value to profit and loss for any financial assets which we keep for speculation purposes or fair value to other comprehensive income for, let's say, midterm investments. Or amortized cost less impairments if our intention is to hold the financial instrument until maturity. Impairments is going to be calculated using the new adjusted cash flows deriving from the instrument and discounted at the original discount rate. If we will change also the discount rate to reflect the same risk, we will be basically double counting the risk because we also adjusted the cash flows and we will adjust also the interest rate to reflect basically the same risk. Where shall we report the gain? Well, as the name says, it's either fair value to profit or loss or other comprehensive income. With uh, amortized costs, we will just show a finance income in the PNL. Financial liabilities, that is something like trade risk payables, debenture loans, redeemable preference shares, an obligation to pay cash or exchange financial instruments in conditions which, for instance, are not favorable to the company. Initial recognition is still at fair value and subsequent measurement for financial liabilities can also be either amortized cost or fair value which especially for derivatives and uh, financial liabilities, which are helpful trading. Gains and losses will be reported directly in profit and loss. Recognition and derecognition criteria for financial instrument will be slightly different than what we know from um, the framework. We want to reflect financial instruments in our financial statements for as long as possible. That actually translates in the fact that when we become a party to the contract, when we basically sign the contract, we will have to include the financial instrument, either an asset or a liability, in our financial statements. And they should be re recognized when we are risk-free, basically. What do we mean or by risk-free? All risks actually embodied in the financial instrument should have been either expired or transferred to another party. Fair value accounting. Fair value actually means market value. So if the market is acting irrationally, okay, this will lead with this to dysfunctional financial reporting. What do we mean by that? 
So let's say you buy an instrument and you pay $4 for that share. The market price, if it goes up, let's say to $6, up to here, we will report the gain directly in PL. On the other hand, if in the next year it will drop to $1, then we will report this time the loss in our PL. So basically speaking, all this variation in the share price will be reported directly in our PL. The fair value can be determined if the instrument is quoted by reference to the market value. And we have to take the best achievable market value, not deducted the transaction cost. We have to, if the market value is not available, we will use valuation techniques. I don't know, looking at expected cash flows, the timing of those cash flow, market rate, credit risk, interest rate, in order to value the financial instrument. And exceptionally, if we cannot use even discounting cash flow techniques, we will keep the instrument at historical cost. Amortized cost can apply to debt instruments only, if and only if, Two tests are basically passed. The business model test, which actually reflects the way in which um, the company will design their um, the policy with respect to financial instruments and contractual cash flow characteristics test. Let's take a look at them in turn. So a business model test is actually what is the intention of the company when actually have, has bought the asset. Either we have bought the financial instrument, let's say, for speculation purposes, meaning I intend to sell it before it actually reaches maturity, or I can keep it until maturity in order to actually collect all the contractual cash flows um, related to the instrument. Okay? If we intend to actually collect the cash flows. It means that the company will have very few sales of financial instruments before their maturity date. And in this, this case, we actually said that the business model test has been passed and therefore the company can, ac can account for the debt instrument at amortized cost. If this is not the case, it means that the asset will not be kept uh, until maturity in order to collect the contractual cash flows and we actually bought it to actually speculate the market from the increase in value or changes in value of the instrument. If this is the situation, we actually failed the business model test and therefore we cannot apply amortized cost in accounting for such instruments. Contractual cash flow characteristics test, this actually determines whether the contractual term of the financial assets give rise at certain specified date solely to actually principal and interest. If this is not the case, then the test is actually failed and financial asset cannot be measured at amortized cost. For example, convertible bonds contain the right at maturity to actually convert the liability into equity and therefore will fail this test and most of them will be accounted for at fair value to profit and loss. In summary, for a debt instrument to be measured at amortized cost will actually require that we keep it until maturity, the asset is held until maturity, and I will actually collect cash flows, which actually consist of repayment of principal, if you want, and payment of on interest on the outstanding principal. The impairments. When we talk about impairments with financial instrument, uh, all instruments which are accounted for at fair value, those are automatically impaired at each year end. So impairments will have to take into consideration in exam scenario only for the assets which are actually kept at amortized cost. Then the value of the impairment will be calculating looking at the revised cash flows 
at the original rate in order not to double count the risk. Convertible bond. This is a must to know for F7 examination. A convertible bond is actually a bond upon its maturity will actually be either repaid in cash or converted into shares. The option is not under the control of the company. The option is basically under the control of the holder. Convertible bonds will always sell for a higher price than the non-convertible bonds because these options to convert it into share will actually give you a potential gain at the end of the instrument. Also for convertible bonds, the interest paid will be lower than the market rate or the coupon, which is based for non, which is common for similar instruments without the conversion option. A convertible bond is not that different if you want, um, or actually contains the both elements for an equity and of those of a liability. What I mean by that? So under a convertible bond, the obligation actually is to pay interest on an annual basis usually, to repay the principal, which is the amount that was borrowed, and convert into shares. So, do we have an obligating event to actually pay interest? Uh, to pay interest? Yes, we do. Do we have an obligating event to repay the principal? Yes. Do we have an obligating event to convert shares? Yes. It depends on what the holder wants at the maturity date. Is there an outflow of resources from the company? When we are paying interest, of course it is. When we are repaying the loan or the principal, yes it is. When we actually convert into shares, this is not an outflow. So therefore, the obligation to actually pay the interest, it's a liability. Why? Because there is an obligating event and there, there is an outflow of resources from the company and that meets the definition of a liability. It's the same thing when we talk about uh, repayment of the principal. Yes, there is an obligating event because we signed the contract and there is an outflow of resources at the end of the instrument. The conversion into share basically is not an outflow, but we have to issue shares, which is another piece of paper if you want, and that will actually be reflected as equity. So that's instrument, convertible bond, is actually what is called a compound instrument. Compound instrument. Why? Because it has the features of liability, payment of interest, repayment of principal, and it has features of equity. And IS32 actually says we have to split the instrument between the liability and the equity component at the inception of the instrument. How we can do that? is pretty much as follows. We will look at the cash flows which are implicit in the instrument and we will discount it at the nominal value or present value using an interest rate which is available for similar instrument without conversion rights. 
So I look at the cash flows implicit in the compound instrument, which my company just issued. I evaluate at present value using a market rate for similar instruments without conversion, right? To actually put a value on the pure liability side of the instrument. The rest, the rest meaning the difference between how much I cashed and how much I have to repay back as liability must be the equity component under this instrument. So if you want to put a value to it, okay? So basically, let's say we issued 10,000 bonds with a nominal value of $100. On 1st of January 2001, each bond will pay a coupon, which is the interest of 7% per annum. On 31st of December 2003, each bond may be repaid in full at nominal value, so no premium on this instrument, or it can be converted, let's say, into 20 $1 shares. When we issue the instrument, which is on 1st of January 2001, the market rate for similar instrument, so the market rate, for similar instruments without conversion, that's 10%. Without conversion. So if instead of buying this instrument, which gives me the right to convert it into shares, I would have bought a normal liability one, okay? The interest rate paid to me would have been 10% instead of seven. So, how shall we determine the value of the instrument when we actually issue it? If you see this in the exam, all you have to do is to split the instrument between the liability and the equity component. In order to do this, I will have to look for three consecutive years at the cash flows implicit in the instrument. So, for year one, year two, and year three, which is 2001, 2002, and 2003, we will actually have, in terms of cash flows, in year one, I will have to pay interest. And interest is 10,000 bonds, $1 nominal share will pay 7% interest. That's 70,000. In year two, in order to value the instrument, I will still have a cash outflow of 70,000. And at the end of year three, I will have an outflow of the interest, 70,000 plus 1 million, which is a payment of the principal. So 1 million, 70,000. And the rate, discount factors, which more likely will be given to you in the exam, to be used to bring this liability at present value should be 10%, not 7 the market rate. So basically all I have to do is multiply these cash flows with the discount factor for year one, year two, and year three, which will give me 63, 630, 57, 820, and 8, So the total value of the liability, total liability, when I sign, this contract is actually 925,020. 
which means the equity part is how much I cash, which is a million, less the liability side will give me a value of 74,980 for the equity component of this instrument. And then how we account for it, we will account for the liability at the amortized cost and at the end of the instrument at maturity date, which is 31st of December 2003, we will actually do whatever the holders will want. Either we issue shares or we will give them the million back. How amortized cost actually works out in practice, it will pay off in the exam to actually use the... Um, Following pro forma, you'll start with an opening balance of the liability on which interest it will be accumulated, which is a finance cost at 10%. Make sure you use the same rate you used to discount back. It will be used to increase up the value of the liability. Then you'll ha have the coupon which is paid and you'll ever will always pay at 7% and closing liability, which is the year end value for the liability. So in 2001 or year one, our opening balance is exactly what we just calculated, $925,020, on which 10% finance cost will be charged directly to PNL which is 92502. What we will pay is the coupon based on nominal value, which is exactly the cash flows where we started. So we will pay 70,000, giving us the closing liability. If I add them up less the coupon which I'm paying, that's actually 947522. In year two, this will become my opening liability plus 10%, which actually means 94,752. I'm still paying 70,000 as coupon, which gives me 972 to 74 year end liability. And at the end of year three, I will do the same exercise for one more year. Apply 10%, 97277, pay 70,000, and you will end up with 999501, which actually shows a rounding error because the value should have been 1 million, okay? We cut a few decimal places now and then. Now, at the end of year three, we will actually do whatever the holders will tell us to do. Either we give them the money back or we just issue shares. And basically, this is, how, this is the most complicated thing that you will encounter with respect to financial instruments for F7 examination.